All right. Recording. Um, and sorry about the doorbell. It's a setting that we can't fix now that we're in the in the room. So uh, I want to welcome you. Thanks for showing up. Uh, Good um, have a tally. Of, yes. How many times you can make an attendance pun <laughs> of some sort? It's going to be fantastic. Um, but we are very glad that you are here and I'm going to, um, I'll be working the slide deck. So forgive me if I'm behind the times a little bit here as we go, but I'm going to start by turning it over to my colleague, Hannah, who's going to kick us off. Hey folks. Um, thanks for coming. And, uh, especially during a, the busyness of advising week. Um, and I, I kind of took the lead on this uh, presentation. I don't know if I should uh, say sorry to start with, but <laughs> um, I did attend the faculty forum and I thought that that might be a good place for us to kind of start. Um, and this um, this slide here was just a couple of uh, kind of quotes that I pulled from various locations, faculty forum, you know, some teams, posts, events, um, maybe an email that was sent out at some point to uh, all faculty. And I just want to kind of start this by recognizing kind of this feeling of like frustration and, and um, uh, you know, the vulnerability of admitting kind of like that we're having this problem and um, just uh, the, the helplessness maybe too that a lot of us feel just because um, we've been trying lots of things and still kind of seeing this, this issue with uh, students kind of showing up and being engaged. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, I also want to recognize that we're um, not going to solve this issue um, whatsoever during an hour long, you know, collab um, um, event. Um, and I just want to say, um, you know, Robin's gonna kick us off with some data, some of the research around attendance, um, engagement among students. And I just want to call to attention everybody, like the nuance and the complexity of this issue. Um, you know, we are not going to be able to solve attendance um, issues at PSU. We, uh, this is kind of, you know, to steal the language of uh, our, you know, home program. This is a, this is a wicked problem. There's a lot of nuance. Um, Robin said it really nicely the other day, the sweet spot of, of attendance is always going to be, you know, move a moving target. We can't craft the perfect attendance policy to meet all of the needs of our students. Um, and we can't solve attendance in one hour in a one hour long session. But what we are kind of hoping is to move past this feeling, these feelings of frustration and helplessness and um, just have some movement a little bit. Um, so we're hoping that that helps um, folks today to just have some movement in a direction. It doesn't have to be the right direction. It's not going to be the direction that solves everything, but kind of moving from this place of uh, frustration to, um, I don't want to use the word productivity, but movement is is, is the word action. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we will let you... Uh, We'll give you the slide decks and the recordings afterwards, so um, don't feel like you need to be grabbing all that stuff as we go. Um, and I am going to start by citing uh, some of the research and attendance. Uh, it, it's not the most scintillating field of study I found <laughs> as I was doing the survey, um, but it's it's really interesting to know that even before COVID, it was a very rich field for study. Um, and our social, social scientists for sure have us covered um, in looking at attendance. So there was some great stuff to pull uh, that I want to share with you. And um, this stuff from uh, Oldfield et al. And again, we will share the resource list for you if you want to look more at these studies. Um, let me just make you small. There we go. Um, uh, it is some is a research that's cited by a lot of people who who design studies around attendance. So um, oh, it, the it, it seems to be something that a lot of people draw on in the field. Um, and these were uh, four uh, of the reasons that Oldfield basically felt like were groupings under which many reasons could fit. So feelings of isolation um, or undeveloped sense of belonging. Um, and obviously that sense of belonging is something that we have tracked with uh, retention and persistence. And it's one of the reasons why we use that term um, so often in our initiatives right now. 
uh, a negative perception of lecturers in terms of personality or teaching approach, like that's kind of just a hard nut to swallow. <laughs> uh, but there it is uh, as one of the uh, reasons um, for non-attendance. Uh, the adoption of a consumerist or instrumental discourse that focuses the attention on a final product, like a grade obtained, overlooking the demands of the learning process. That's related to the question of, um, but if I can still do well on the test, why do I need to be there for, um, for the learning? And this is even more of a challenge now that we lean uh, as a nation so much towards competency-based education. So of course the question is if I can prove competence, does the process matter? Do I need to come for this discussion? Um, and then finally, the external pressures and demands that require time from the students and reduce the time they have to dedicate to their studies. Inside of that one also include things like um, illness or uh, uh, socioeconomic reasons that might prevent your, you from having transportation. So what this means is that as we dig into attendance, um, you can see here on the left, that we're using the word attendance to talk about a series of issues that we would not necessarily ever group together when we're thinking about solving them. For example, we don't talk together about like, how do we solve these weather challenges and the risk of suicide, right? Like these are very different kinds of issues that um, conspire together to create a complex pattern for attendance. I really liked that in a planning meeting, um, Hannah talked about this, and perhaps you don't like this, right, because you've heard it so much, but the, but again, to go back to that idea of it's a wicked problem, um, but think of it as a, an even wickeder problem than something like um, global hunger, because at least with global hunger, you can envision what the solution would look like. It would be that everybody would be fed. The problem with attendance is you don't necessarily want to say if we did this correctly, everyone would always attend. Because for example, if somebody is very ill or needs to attend a funeral for their mom, we wouldn't consider it a win for them to come to class instead. So it becomes even more challenging because it's not always the best solution um, to a particular problem to have students attend. So as we're looking at attendance, we're realizing um, the, the actual wickedness of the problem that we're dealing with. And that's why we don't aim to solve the problem of attendance because it's too reductive for what we're dealing with. That being said, it was pretty interesting to look at the data because it is quite persuasive um, that there is indeed um, not just correlation, but causation um, between attendance and what we generally classify as student success. And there's lots of ways to measure student success and the way most of the social science data measures it may not be your way, but they do things like look at um, DFW rates, right? Drops, failures, and withdrawals, um, the grades that students are achieving in classes. So you have to realize when you're looking at this research, you are looking at a particularly sort of quanti quantitative approach um, to how we're thinking about teaching and learning. But we do see from some of the research, here's uh, one example, class attendance is a better predictor of college grades than any other known predictor of academic performance, including blah, 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 all the other things that we think are so important, right? <laughs> um, maybe not SATs, but other things, right? Your study habits, your study skills, right? It's pretty important. This is why no matter how nuanced I think the attendance conversation is, when Ruby went off to college, I said, I don't care what else you do, you just get your ass to class, <laughs> right? So um, as much as I can sit here and say, like, these are complex things, there's a part of us um, that knows, and it is reflected in the data, that attendance um, really matters. And it even matters when it's disaggregated from other things like socioeconomic class or um, uh, high school GPA, you're still going to be more successful if you are attending class. Um, by the way, I should have said, I don't know if you guys are using the chat. I can't see it right now. You're more than welcome to folks who are online. Chat there, bring it up later, whatever you want. Uh, there's also some data that shows that carefully crafted attendance policies can have positive effects on pass and completion rates. It's kind of a useless sentence as it's written there because you know everything that matters is in the phrase carefully crafted, right? <laughs> Um, and there is some disagreement about that, but 
really what showing um, was that as opposed to having no attendance policy, which is something that um, you know I tend to lean towards pedagogically, and I will say I, I don't think I've ever taught without an attendance policy, so I believe in them, but I lean towards a very highly flexible, almost like no attendance policy. But the data seems to suggest that if you communicate about attendance and talk about attendance and set policies that are tied to your pedagogy and explain to your students, that alone will have a positive um, impact on pass and completion. So that's disaggregated from whether or not students attend, it's having these carefully crafted policies also makes a difference. I found that to be very interesting. Um, this one I just dropped in, it's much more instrumental and tiny, but it's one of the things we hear so often from faculty. Um, attendance was not significantly affected in this particular study to instructor provided notes or PowerPoints. So what that means is that if you record your entire class and make all the notes available to your students, it will not negatively affect their attendance rates. Um, you can go, I don't believe you, I'm just telling you what the data says. <laughs> um, and I do think one of my favorite kinds of, like my favorite thing in social science research is when obvious things are disproven, right? So I, I like that that's a bit of a myth that we have um, about, it doesn't mean that it never does, but in general, it does not have that effect. Shall I tell you something even more devastating that I didn't even put on the slide? Yes. I'm like, yeah. I know. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I got to go rewrite a bunch of stuff. <laughs> um, the other thing in this study was that there was also no positive impact on student success or learning in terms of like um, grades, measurements, any of the metrics they were using, if you provide those things. So basically, basically what I'm saying is like, you should provide those things. It's not going to affect attendance. It's also not going to help your students, but whatever. Um, I believe incredibly strongly for a whole bunch of reasons that you should provide those things, but um, stay in focus like a laser on attendance. So let's keep on going. Um, and then here, of course, is the kicker uh, that's going to lead into some other conversation here. Um, some studies show that it, it actually does not matter if but rather how students attend class. They don't mean modality, they mean engagement, right? So um, this study was particularly taking issue with the first set of studies that I quoted that said, like I said to Ruby, get your butt in that seat, I don't care what else you do. I'm basically saying to Ruby, like, I don't care how high you are or if you're asleep, go to class, right? What, they, what these studies did is they started pulling that apart a little bit, saying, okay, well, what happens if we start testing for the engagement effect, for whether students are disengaged or engaged while in class, and whether that makes a difference? And they found that absolutely it makes a difference, that if students are not engaged, it is actually not particularly helpful if they attend. Um, these are also really loaded things, because what do I mean by engagement? Now, in the social science research, they have a whole bunch of things that indicate what engagement is so they can watch you and they can code it and they can decide if you're engaged. You as a faculty member may have slightly different metrics or you may need to dive into this research if that's what you're what you're interested in. But obviously, part of what we're talking about with engagement is not so much the seat time issue. Right. It's really how do we get our students to show up? And that was a beauty, beautiful pun of my colleague Hannah's title for this, right, is that it's not just about showing up, it's really about showing up, right, because that's where we're going to get um, the bump in student success. Um, so uh, it, to take these studies a little bit further, there are studies that show that adding required engagement elements before and after lectures improves both learning and attendance. Um, this seems obvious, but it's that last thing and attendance that I think is really interesting for this presentation. So we're not surprised that if you engage your students and what that meant in this study was some interactive um, thing, whether, and, and you know, again, you like some of these, you hate some of these, some of these were clickers, um, some of these were stopping to give um, low stakes assessments, some of them were class discussions, right, these were all the different ways that your students could be involved, we see things like um, using chats and Zoom, any of these kind of engagement metrics, but it actually showed that not only was their learning improved, 
but their attendance was also improved. So um, that's an interesting thing because we say, how do we get them to attend so they can be engaged? Well, some of the data shows that if we get them to engage, that's when they attend. Um, and this gets to some of the, you know, displacement of blame when we blame students for not ascent, not attending. We also know that we have to look at ourselves to see how we are engaging um, our students. Um, high engagement, this is a Gallup um, research study of uh, a, a corporate um, environment. So this is not from education. So I think that's uh, important. The, the first part of the study came from, um, from this corporate study. The second part here is when they're, they're citing um, data on education, that high engagement consistently leads to more positive outcomes, such as higher productivity, lower absenteeism, higher quality work, and higher job satisfaction. Engaged students are two and a half times more likely to say they do well in school and are 4.5 times more hopeful about their futures than their disengaged peers. Um, so again, these are just, this is just data that shows us how mashed together the conversations about engagement and, um, and the other thing, attendance are, um, and that it's a bit of a chicken and the egg thing, that you're not really going to be able to do one to cause the other. You're going to have to look at the, um, the way those two things interact with each other as you're doing your planning. Um, and this is me uh, transitioning into my colleague uh, Martha Burtis's section um, by uh, some of you know Kevin Gannon, the, the tattooed prof. That's his his handle, and he's he's a, a really wonderful um, writer. His last book is called Radical Hope. Um, but he is he sort of pulled this part in some conversations about attendance, especially as we start thinking about um, ableism and um, equity and thinking about the parts of attendance that can sometimes inequitably uh, students who are suffering from chronic illness, uh, students who are disabled, or um, students who have other like serious mental health, family crises, socioeconomic issues that impede their attendance. He talks about the difference between intellectual rigor and logistical rigor. Intellectual rigor challenges students to explore complex ideas, refine their own thinking, Logistical rigor requires adherence to strict policies about when and how work is produced and evaluated. An intellectually difficult course need not be logistically difficult, and it shouldn't be. The last, uh, last sentence there, it shouldn't be, that's the opinion, so you can take it or leave it. The idea, though, that these are separate, I think, is very beneficial. You may believe, and some people do, that logistical rigor matters. I certainly hear faculty say, when you get a job, you're not going to be able to be late, you know. <laughs> Seems not to be true in this office where I just come when I feel like it, but, you know, most <laughs> jobs, um, you know, it, it may be true. So you may have that belief, unlike Kevin, that, that you want to teach that way. But I think even if that is your belief, it's helpful to understand the difference between claiming to have a rigorous class that is intellectually challenging versus that kind of logistical rigor that is maybe a little bit more about inflexibility. Um, so when we're thinking about our pedagogy, we can think about moving flexibility and rigor in different on different um, uh, planes, right? Whether it be the intellectual plane or the logistical plane. So I think that's a helpful thing to think about and will be related maybe to some of the things that um, Martha's going to look into. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martha. So um, for the next couple of slides, I'd, I want to talk about is sort of what this all potentially means in terms of teaching and pedagogy. And I will um, confess to start that being in a role like I am working with faculty, particularly right in the, over the last couple of years, it's um, it's it's pretty humbling because uh, most of the problems that people are dealing with would be what we would consider wicked in nature. And when they come to me for advice and help, I, I can't solve them. Um, there, and, and I say that as a caveat to what I'm gonna show because there is no, as Hannah started us out with today, the idea that there is no solution to this problem. Um, it's incredibly complex, it's multifaceted. And in the, in the, you know, vein of being a wicked problem, one of the 
hardest parts is that when you enact something that you think is going to help one group of students, it might actually hurt another group of students. And so you're con we're constantly living in the middle of that complexity and tension when we're talking about this issue of attendance and engagement. But I still want to give people some ideas and some things to consider and think about that maybe they haven't tried before with the understanding that if you really want to address this, and I'll talk about this more, if you really want to address this problem, it probably means doing some work, understanding what this problem is in the context of your students and your class. And that what, what it is in, in that your context may be very different from a colleague's context or another colleague's context, or even another class that you teach. And so being cognizant of that, I think is really, really important. So on the left here are some of the, the issues that Robin kind of unearthed in the research that contribute to attendance. So feelings of isolation, dis disengagement, negative perceptions about education, their education, their courses, in this whole concept of it kind of instrumentalism of education and focus on product versus process, educational trauma, um, which so many of our students carry with them and doesn't often get addressed, um, and these external pressures, which are so varied and variable and often difficult to even know until you have a particular group of stu students in front of you because they're so personal. And what I want to try and do now is translate, not to talk about, okay, here are the things you can do to improve attendance, but here are the pedagogical moves that engage with some of these issues. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is this idea of building an next slide. I like having Robin do my, my Sorry, slide. I, I was just so engrossed yeah. in the yeah. slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, building and emphasizing community. Um, which we, you know, especially during, um, you know, the, the complexity of the last couple of years, there's been lots of conversation about what it means to build classroom community when we're working in different modalities. What I've done on each of these slides is just pull some ideas or practices from the literature, from other people's work. Each of these, once you get the slide deck, will link you to the original article or piece if you want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, None of these, as I said, are silver bullets, but they may give you some ideas of things that you haven't tried before. So on the upper left here, we have an idea from Kathy Davidson, who's talking about, has for years and years done this idea of having a uh, drawing up a class constitution um, as a way of considering what community means within a classroom, what, what norms there are, what behavioral norms, what policies and procedures are important, but also what it means to be in a, a, an intellectual community together, to engage in this work together, and, and codifying that as a classroom community. Another faculty member who uses um, music as a way to, to bring music and playlists into the classroom space as a way to engage students a little bit in um, building something together that contributes to community, but isn't about the class necessarily. Um, and then finally, um, uh, building in ways for students to reach out and talk to each other and and, and uh, through, through almost like a pen pal type of assignment or activity um, to talk more informally about their learning, about their lives, about what's going on. Um, that's maybe influencing their participation in class, but may not be the, the focus of that particular class. Um, it would be uh, difficult to talk about this without also talking about this the issue, the, the issue that assessment plays in all of this, because so many of our concerns about attendance are realized through the assessment tools that we use. Our students often feel the effect of their low attendance when assessment comes about. But really the question of students focusing more on product versus process at the heart of a lot of that, so many of the solutions to that um, issue are about how we assess, um, how we um, have our students demonstrate what they've learned and how we assess that work. Um, so I've linked here to a couple of um, resources about alternative assessment and ungrading. Um, so I, I want to make sure we leave time for everybody to, to, to explore their own ideas today. So I will let people explore some of this on their own. But in particular, I want, want to draw you or your attention to uh, the Collabs Ungrading resource page, which is where we regularly add new, we've for years added resources and update that with new resources about alternative assessment um, and how that might play into this issue. And for those who don't, you know, haven't explored ungrading yet, I think it's really important to say um, it, it's such a huge blanket for basically the idea that you are trying to move from a grading culture to a feedback and 
So it, it's still about assessment, but it's really about how to authentically assess and support students as they improve their work. And that goes from really radical proposals to very gentle you know, interventions. It's so. a long continuum and there's lots of different ways to practice it. We're always happy to talk to people about where they may fall um, along that continuum. Flexibility and adaptability is obviously another um, pedagogical move that might help you address um, student engagement issues, um, both the practical um, issues that students may face and maybe some of the more existential issues that students may face academically. Um, so the upper left-hand one here, I like, don't know how to refer to these, um, is talking about this idea of having due windows as opposed to due dates, um, which some of us have probably uh, um, experimented with. I've experimented with practices like this before. One of the things I'll say is that, again, there is no magic bullet. And very often you have to try a couple of different things in order to find the, the mechanism, the flexibility mechanism that works best not only for your students, but for you as well. Because it's really important for us to understand that the trade-off for flexibility should not be making your life unlivable, right? And making your job untenable. So finding that sweet spot where you're extending flexibility and grace to your students, but doing it in a way that allows you to continue to teach authentically to your values and also live your life <laughs> the way that you want to live it and teach the way you want to teach is really important. And I think the data is quite clear from what I could read that um, having a policy that spells out what you think. And, and the fact that the, the conclusion of that study was that it had to be thoughtful. I really think the only way you can demonstrate thoughtfulness is if you are in a slightly rich conversation with your students. Otherwise, how can they know that it's thoughtful? How can anyone know that something's thoughtful? So I think you're going to get a bump just by thinking about it and crafting it and communicating it. Um, and that seems to work better than just saying, I'm flexible, whatever you want right. is, is going to be fine. Um, as we know, because a lot of us had to do that during COVID because, you know, you, you had to relax almost everything, that that can really bite a lot of students in the yeah, and then the other practice here is just another <laughs> flexibility technique using passes instead of a, a, a deadline window. The Carolyn Canane sponge theory mm -hmm. for right. I keep hearing about the for sponge those theory. who remember. Yeah. I utilize the sponge. I know. It, for those who don't know what we're talking about, I'm sorry. That's just going to have to be how it is. Go ahead, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, a former faculty it's member. It's we're it's very it's bitter that we oh, lost her, but she had yeah. wonderful. Um, techniques, which really were the second one on Martha's sheet mm -hmm. there about. Um, Wait, are you actually not going to say what the sponge is? You had to like <laughs> carry around an actual sponge on the day that you otherwise would have skipped class because you're totally unprepared, but instead you hold the sponge. I think she made it so that you could, you would pin the sponge to yourself, sort of like a scarlet letter, but only. That's it was, it. The sponge, yeah. You pin this. I think you're right. She, you had to pin the sponge on. Um, but then it was the idea was like you're just absorbing, and that's okay sometimes, right? Just come and take in what you can. Um, but it really goes, I think, on Martha's other slide to that um, that other idea there, yeah. right? Okay. Um, so one of the points that the research showed that Robin was talking about was that it's not just about attending; it's about how we attend. Um, and so. In this vein, I think this is it, pedagogically about rethinking what we consider participation. So it's not just about butts and seats, which is a really typical kind of, I would say, regressive way of thinking about attendance. Um, it's, it's instead, it's really thinking about what it means to participate in a class, what it is we're looking for in terms of participation. And there's lots of really great um, work out there of people who, who who've been rethinking the whole concept of participation and ways to have this conversation with your students because um, getting back to, and I'm gonna reemphasize this again in a minute, what Robin was just saying, so much of this is about A, being mindful and thoughtful about the issue, but B, figuring out how you're bringing that mindfulness and thoughtfulness into conversation with your students, um, as opposed to it just being a policy that's listed on your syllabus that you expect them to read and adhere to. Um, I personally have tried some of 
these techniques for, for rethinking participation. And it is always one of my favorite things to have students speak up and say, well, I'll, I'll ask them, well, can you, let's talk about what participation can look like in this community. When I have those students who speak up and say, sometimes participation looks like listening. Um, because it get, that gets lost so often when we're talking about um, about this issue that some of we've all been in a class where a student is speaking and nobody's paying attention um, and you can tell and the student who's speaking can tell and what a gift it is when their classmates do listen um, and attend to who's attend right like at the root of attendance is this idea of attending to each other. Um, and then this is the last one, and it is in many ways, in, if in my mind, the most important and perhaps the only important one, which we keep coming back to. Um, and that's about this idea of transparent pedagogy, which I still really wanna do a workshop at some point in the collab about transparent pedagogy. We talk about it a lot. And when I talk to faculty about it, when I hear people talk about it in other places, very often when we talk about transparent pedagogy, what we interpret it to mean is, I'm transparent with my students about what I expect of them. I give them rubrics, right? That's my be me being transparent with them. And both of these pieces go beyond that and are trying to point out that that actually isn't the idea behind transparent pedagogy. Um, transparent pedagogy is about entering into a conversation with your students and making visible to them the pedagogical choices that you're making and why you're making them. Um, and being willing then to engage with them and revisit and rethink and refine those pedagogical choices based on who you have in the class this semester, right? The students who you're actually teaching. You know, we, we craft our syllabi, we craft our policies before we even meet our students. So then we go into a class and who knows what of those lists of variables and issues on the left that Robin showed our students are contending with that could ultimately impact their ability to attend. Um, and so finding a way to be transparent with our students that we want to know these things, we want to understand these things so that we can craft a community together that's going to be supportive and flexible, but also humane and rigorous in ways that we agree we want to be rigorous, um, is, is that to me is the real challenge. And I don't know, I've never really talked explicitly with any faculty about this, I think, like what might hinder us from addressing our classes transparently. I suspect if I had to guess that a lot of it has to do with fear. Like there is a certain vulnerability all of our teaching takes vulnerability and it takes even more vulnerability for you to walk into a class with the students you are teaching and say, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing and open yourself up to criticism and critique and feedback. Um, and so I, I wanna just acknowledge that I understand that that's hard. Um, and there are techniques though that we can take and there are steps that we can take to make it easier for ourselves to do this. And, and most importantly, once you do it and you reap the reward and you see in your students what changes in your relationship with them and with the class, it makes it that much easier to do in the future. I think time is probably the other major thing I hear from faculty, yeah. right? Yeah. I have content. Yes. You know, like to a certain degree, a lot of stuff we teach is literally contentless because yeah. we're, te you know, we're te teaching about teaching. And so we're I able education to pause, faculty, right? right? But I think we're, <laughs> we're not even There's teaching, no we're, yes. we're like so meta, yes. right? Yes. That everything yes. we do, we're using, right? Yes. But if I, when I have to teach about the Civil War, yes. like there's some challenges there. But I also think just like you said, there's techniques to reduce the vulnerability. There's also techniques to reduce the time, you know, yes. like to be yes. able to do these things without and to, taking two weeks off. And to embed know? them within the other work of the class. And up before you went on from that. Don't, so in the, in the spirit of transparency, <laughs> I am going to get meta with you right now <laughs> and talk about the, the tech, the, the pedagogical move that I did not put up here and I did not address. And that's really important because it comes up again and again in the research. We hear of it and we see it with our students which is when our students are struggling with attending because they are having them set, they themselves have, have, and the way I'm gonna put this, although it's a broad umbrella and it's not the most precise, is executive functioning challenges that um, 
they struggle with in order to stay on task, to stay organized, to prioritize what they should be doing and when they should be doing it. There is so much research out there that links those kinds of issues to problems with attendance and participation. And there is also significant research that shows when trauma increases, executive functioning goes down. And we cannot, we have to acknowledge that our students have lived through significant trauma educationally, over, personally and educationally over the last three years. And I want to suggest that a lot of what we are seeing, it continues to be the effect of that trauma and how that is affecting their ability to just function in ways that allow them to attend. Um, and the reason why I didn't bring this up is that if you go out and you look at the literature and the examples of how you deal with this, they very rarely are situated in the context of a course. They're usually situated in other kinds of support mechanisms that a, that a university or institution might offer. We do this ourselves through programs like Ascent, through programs like Rebalance, which are incredibly admirable programs. But the challenge of those is what the research also shows us, which is that addressing those issues deep without the context of the educational setting, decontextualizing those executive functioning issues from the content, from the work, from the education is less effective. So what that really suggests is that we find a way to try and build some capacity to help our students move through these issues into our classes themselves. And so I didn't put that in here because A, there's not a lot of great ideas of how to do that. And I su su um, suppose, I, su I assume, that that is for the same reason Robin just mentioned, which is that who has time? <laughs> like we're trying to do all of these things, like teaching executive functioning skills is just one more thing. But um, one thing the research does show is that having a standalone course where you teach executive functioning doesn't really work. And the research I'm referring to is called IAC, <laughs> Introduction to the Academic <laughs> Community. I did this research myself for a whole bunch of years here at Plymouth State when we had this, you know, and, and of course we've all had the call to return back to that course, right? A kind of how to how to college course. And I'm not even, a, I'm not opposed, I'm not for it. Like, I don't care what we teach, like the, it, it doesn't matter. Um, what I do think though, is that um, just like comp or anything else, in order to really get the benefit of these things, we're gonna have to start asking harder questions about how to embed that stuff across the curriculum, right? Um, so it, it might be worth it to have some places where you pull together some of the key skills, um, but that's not really gonna be helpful unless we're um, you know, echoing that in, in our curriculum. But uh, I think some of what Hannah has planned in this activity may get to some of the ways that you're helping your students not just show up, but get their lives <laughs> situated and their learning situated in such a way that they can have the mental space to show up. Um, it's a thing that I am working on every day with my own child right now. So this part of the uh, workshop is very, very important <laughs> to me. Um, so go ahead, Hannah. Sure. So um, I dropped in in the chat a link to this um, Google document and for folks here um, you can either go to the Google document or we have them um, in paper form for folks who didn't bring laptops or don't want to open them up. Um, so let me tell you in um, the spirit of transparency the building this activity was really difficult because I was like how do I solve this problem? No, mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. Um, I, <laughs> I really didn't want to um, a discussion um, to kind of devolve into us continuously kind of running through the frustration, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I really, really hope that um, we can kind of take what we've talked about today and just think about movement, um, get away from like this feeling of paralysis and frustration and just some movement. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that folks are frustrated and there's also um, lots of stuff that we're probably having a hard time with showing up um, for as well. Um, and I think there's kind of like a twofold thing as, as we reflect on our own showing up, we can kind of build empathy for our students. We can think about the things that have worked for us that might work for students. We could um, work on transparency, being transparent with our own struggles with showing up. 
And then the other part of this activity is to think about the things that we've tried, the things that haven't worked, the things we can tweak, the things that we can throw away completely or try again, just to kind of recognize that this is like a process um, and we're just looking for movement on, on this issue, you know, individually. And we can't solve it all ourselves, but what can we do um, in the time being? So uh, we have like 20-ish minutes left. Um, so I don't know, Robin and Martha, maybe 10. Yep. And then maybe we could try to come back to share some stuff. Anybody has anything to share? Yeah, we'll, After we'll just uh, take 10 minutes in, in silence. And what would be really great is if instead of like, you know, leaving, <laughs> um, you really took a minute to just do a little bit of this because what I think we can do with this in addition to sharing a, a few thoughts um, is that we can curate this stuff into a kind of part two for this. Maybe we won't even have to attend, but we can send something out that might be um, some additional stuff along with um, all of the links that will direct you to some of the studies that you might want to to look at. So um, take a few minutes and and just a quick thing for the folks in the Google document. I have um, a bunch of pages so you can find your own blank page to um, claim. Um, you can put your initials at the top. And there's also a space to indicate whether or not you care if this is shared or um, or, or, or if you want to keep it to yourself. That's completely fine as well. Yeah, if you say that you don't want to share it, um, we when we go to use this, we will take yours out. If you don't want to share it at all, because you don't want anyone to see it in the Google Doc, feel free to work offline um, on your own copy. Folks here, if you're willing to share, but you want to work on pen and paper, um, we'll collect those and scan them in and work with them that way. So whatever's good for you. Uh, any questions, you can unmute, ask, use the chat. Um, and ironically, I'm going to leave because I'm <laughs> skipping. I'm skipping class right now. <laughs> in order to call me. <laughs> so I did check with my professor. But another, I'm going to uh, a tally for yeah. the pun about. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh it never. Ends. All right. Um, I will mute us here, and everyone can take ten. So we might want to come back to the group. So as you're finishing up or just starting, it doesn't really matter. And you can, of course, keep working on these as long as, as you want. Um, I do want to say one thing before I hand it over to Hannah to um, maybe ask for folks to share um, is that my druthers would be for everybody to introduce themselves because I think it's really important also for us as a community showing up to do all the things we talked about in those earlier slides, building community. Um, the challenges were so compressed on time. So what I'm going to do is at five o'clock for anyone who can stay, we're just going to go around, say who we are, whatever. But I know there's some folks who just need the content and they have to go. So um, please stick around if you can for a couple of minutes and meet meet your colleagues both in the room and online. Um, so Hannah, do you want to, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can, um, kick it off, but I was just wondering if there's anybody who would like to talk about something that they discussed, um, something they discovered they'd like to share. Um, I know there's a lot of great, uh, comments in the chat too. So if anybody wants to bring some of that to the, um, in-person group. I, I just go oh, right ahead. I just wanted to direct everyone to the link I shared with Seth Perler. He's an executive function coach and runs a free Facebook like conference for parents and educators in August every year. And it's extremely practical. Um, I use a ton of his stuff uh, with my own kids. <laughs> um, and just, you know, it's a way to think about okay, how do we scaffold these things for students and what do they need? And then also like talks directly to why the students who need them the most are the most resistant to using them and how we can help there and sort of the whys behind that behavior. So I have found all of his things to be really, really helpful. 
at least even in just finding compassion. We, we have the link, so we will add that to the resources for this event. So thank you and thank you, because <laughs> I need that. I wanted to share um, a, a thing I did with a class one time that worked so well, but I would never do it again because I think it's pedagogically so horrifying, but I'm wondering <laughs> if there's something we can learn from it, what, what worked about it. So, I, and is Don gone? Yeah, he's gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he wasn't even the president when I did this, so I think it's okay. But um, I did a, a composition class um, that was like completely sort of student created, right? And one of the things we did was we crafted our own policies, which I know a lot of people work on now, and I think it's great. And so I said, you can have whatever attendance policy you want, like you guys can make it and blah, blah, blah. So I left the room and left it to them. And I kind of thought they would say no attendance policy, but that wasn't remotely what they came up with. Um, they came up. So I know a lot of people penalize students in their grades for missing classes. And generally, a lot of people suggest that's not super best practice because you're not actually grading them on their their knowledge of the content. Um, but, you know, you do you. But so my students kind of came up with the reverse of that horror story, which is that they decided to reward their grades for good attendance. And it was obscene what they came up with. They said, if you had perfect attendance, you would have 10 points on your final grade in the class. <laughs> Wow. Right? And then it went from there. It was like, if you miss one, you would get like five points. If you miss, and then down to like no effect, down to if you missed a whole bunch, it would start going negative. <laughs> and here, the problem was, this is the beginning of the class. And I just said, you have the power. You wouldn't. So what am I going to do? Come in and be like, except for that. <laughs> so I was like, what do I care? No one's ever going to know except all the people on Zoom, like recording this. But so we did it. And here is the thing, like I would never do this now because I think it actually encourages an unhealthy kind of ableism, right? Like, I, you know, it's not fair if you can't get the attendance award because you have say a chronic illness or whatever. So I would never do this again, but let me tell you this, in that class, it was an 8 a.m. composition and all but one student had perfect attendance oh my God. at the end of the semester. <laughs> now they all got A's, but you know what? They also deserved them because they had perfect attendance. They're, they did great work, right? <laughs> so it was this crazy thing, which was like, it was so horrible. But at the same time, them showing up and also being like connected to the policy they crafted, like it completely worked. So I was going to say, I wonder how much of that is uh, the students feeling kind of like ownership agency right. and being empowered I don't over know. that decision or them just being chaos goblins. Right. I don't. <laughs> I, I would never do it again because there's so many parts of it yeah. that are problematic. But like, isn't that an interesting experiment that I launched yeah. by mistake? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what. Nick, go ahead. Uh, so not to put um, uh, Jesse Chapman on the spot, I, I believe Jesse is, is, is here via Zoom as well. Jesse and I are co-teaching this semester. Um, uh, Jesse has introduced me the practice of doing check-ins at the beginning of the class and then reinforcements at the end. Just real quick, how you're doing, any access needs we need to be aware of, and like, what's your favorite rom-com? Because we're starting Midsummer Night Stream or something like that. Um, so good, because it gives us it gives us a moment to just like, all sort of like enter the space together. Um, and then at the end to just like recap. And even if folks are in a space like energy wise where they just need to be like camera off in a corner the whole time, it gives them a moment to check back in with the community. So good. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely bringing this forward in all my classes in the future. And I'm actually really curious how, because we've got a class of like 12 and it's mm, sophomores through seniors. And I'm curious how that works if you've got like, 25 to 35 first year students, like what modifications you would make. Um, but uh, it, it, it absolutely a great use of class time every day, so. Go ahead, Jesse. I was gonna say, I can respond directly because I use it in all my classes, including my 27 tackling the wicked problem students I have every semester. Um, it, it works great. I modify the prompts slightly for first year students and students who aren't coming into their learning community with as much buy in as like our self elected Shakespeare for social justice students. 
Um, <laughs> but like in my teaching evaluation, students always say like, this is the only class where I know everyone's name. And like, they learn so much about each other throughout the semester. So it makes the group work less daunting because they talk to their classmates every class. But yeah, so it's been really successful in all, across my gen eds, ascent, theater classes. Um, it comes from the theater practice of enrolling and derolling, which I can talk more about in another time, but I've adapted it to teaching and it's worked really great. Um, can I ask a quick follow-up? I think, um, and then Allison, I saw your hand if you still wanted to go. Um, Jesse, how long does it take um, for each student to kind of do their check-in? It does. I was going to say it does depend on the class, um, but even in my 27 class, usually no more than five minutes and the, the time is well worth it because it gets them present. And I also have a um, an attendance buffer that like if they get there by the end of check in, they're they're not late. <laughs> so um, for students who roll in a couple minutes late, it also eats up that first few minutes of class time where like you don't want to have to start over again with whatever it is you're teaching. So it, it has that other sneaky piece too. Certainly. Yeah. Allison, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, if I can just jump on that. Um, I have classes regularly of anywhere from like 23 to 26. Um, and I do uh, check in with them. It probably helps to know that I teach in social work. So that will frame what I'm about to say. Um, in the senior seminar, which is a two and a half hour once a week class. So there's a different time frame here. I actually do a trauma informed check in where I ask three questions. How are you feeling? What are your goals? And who will you ask for help? And they have to provide a feelings word. They can't say good. Like I actually say eh, and, and make them come up with a feelings word. Somebody last week said, I don't feel anything at all. I said, great, you could be feeling empty. You could, you know, so like I try to really help them with that. Um, the idea, so it's checking in and checking in with your internal, what are your goals? Reminding people that there's always a future and then who can, your, who can you ask for help or who will you ask for help? Reminding us that we're all interconnected. That check-in in senior seminar can take anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes. So it isn't something I do in like my regular 75 minute classes, but in those classes, I often will flash up like a grid of nine silly looking animal faces. I know you've all seen them, pugs, raccoons, kittens, whatever. And I'll ask, you know, just quickly around the class, what pug are you? And again, it just <laughs> really helps bring people into the class and into the moment. It is so useful for getting the people who are there, for getting them to come and sit into the class. Um, it doesn't- It's helpful to like, and, and we're going to end because I want to be respectful of time, but I think it's helpful to me when I think about all these things to also be able to see directly that 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 bears out from the research, right? These things um, about like not belonging somewhere are the first whole group of, um, of key uh, issues that affect uh, attendance. So when you're doing those community-based practices, um, you're absolutely moving the needle um, according to according to a whole ton of studies. Um, Although what's being pointed yeah. out in the chat is important too, because I hate those sorts of things yeah. personally. <laughs> so uh, as Liz and Nick say, you've got there's got to be buy into about buying into community. Um, I, I really really dislike those practices and would never do them myself. It also seems like you know, to make space for that, especially because, you know, I'm very sensitive to, like, for some folks, Matthew may be one of them, you know, I have seen certain kinds of those practices, like, you can see it traumatizing a student, right, like, in, in the room, yeah. um, but it does seem like there's a way to sort of back off, like, the pug was a good example of that, yeah. like, but another thing I think you could do is you could also say, like, if you don't want to share how you feel, you can just pick a pug, you know what I mean? Like, so it doesn't, you don't have to stand down, but you don't have to, you know. Um, I do. I just, could I just jump in and say, I put some stuff in the um, chat because I didn't fully explain the activity. So just so that you all have a little more context to, to answer some of the very legit critique 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do instead of like super um, vulnerable stuff, I teach um, gen ed courses with no one. I teach a major list course. I teach major list courses, teach anthropology classes. So I get <laughs> students from all over, I get freshmen to seniors in the same class, and it's really, it's been difficult, but something that I think someone had mentioned in ACE three, two and a half years ago, was doing um, little index cards that both help with, like, attendance being like, oh, I don't have to say everyone's name, and, like, they can self-identify, things like that, both in the first class, but all through the semester, with questions that are both, like, hey, how are you doing, and what are three things you learned in the reading or what was a thing you learned with a question you have and like mm -hmm. how, where can we go from here things that are like mixed like that I found really helpful especially with like that first kind of buy-in because through the semester even though I have everywhere from freshmen to seniors like it's felt like community so mostly my archaeology classes um weirdly enough but I found that that helps a lot doing um well what do I call them entrance something and then like exit ticket is like this the opposite of like an exit ticket well that's like the double whammy of community plus engagement yeah right? yeah. So, yeah and then like they can be like hey i have something to share from this or i don't want to share that but then i still get a note card saying like something from them um i am going to when we it, it'll take us a little time to make a resource um from this but when we send it out and maybe prior to sending it out i may also send something out to the entire faculty a real easy form where they can also share some of the practices that they have found um, helpful around attendance. So we can put something really helpful together um, as a as a resource for you. So for that reason, it'll take a little bit more time for us to make this available, but we will um, make something available from from all of this. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop recording and I am going to invite.